May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your heart so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Thank you for putting that. There may be some slides that will that'll work. Do you realize there are three things that he's praying for them? Very simple. What is the first one? Verse 12. Grow in love. For all. It's easy to love. You remember the story of Jesus, the parable? In Luke chapter 10, it was given by a very clever guy. It was given because a very clever guy asked a question of Jesus. He said, okay, tell me who should I love? In other words, who might, whom do I not have to love? And Jesus gave him the story of the good enemy. Not the good Samaritan. That would be an oxymoron to the Jews. A Samaritan was a curse word. You don't call the, put the word good before a curse word. The enemy has loved me. The one whom I treated as an enemy, they have loved me. What do I then do? Who do I not give love to? And so, growing in love for all, secondly, he says you live a blameless and holy life. A holy lifestyle. And thirdly, you'll be ready for the coming of the Lord. Sometime later when I preach, maybe I will talk about the coming of the Lord. That itself is an important uh, passage to talk about. But today we are going to look from chapter 4 verses 1 to 12 about two of those expectations that God has from his people. So I am requesting you to please stand to your feet and uh, we're going to read those verses together. Chapter 4 verses 1 to 12. First Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 to 12. Are you ready? We're going to read it together. So whichever version you have, that's all right. Just go ahead, read it out loud, and I will lead you. As for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. And, in this, and that in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you His Holy Spirit. Now, about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. And to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, you should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. You may be seated in God's presence. What we have in chapters 4 and 5, friends, are fresh reminders and fervent appeals on these three things that he prayed for. It's very interesting. In the letters of Paul, very often the introductions or his prayers give you a pointer into where he's going for, going towards in each in the full letter. So in that prayer of Paul, you have those three things. Growing in love, growing in a holy lifestyle, and being ready for the coming of the Lord. And those are the three major things that you look, look at in chapters 4 and 5. So let's begin with the first, first matter. First, 
matter that he's talking about. Before that introduction, chapter 4, verse 1, what we notice is that the, yes, let's go on to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, that the Thessalonians are already living to please God. You see, look at verse 1. They are a model church. They are look, uh, living to please God. But he says, now we ask you to urge you in the Lord to do this more and more. Don't stop there. Don't stop there. You, are, you have a desire to please God. Continue in that desire to please God and have a God-pleasing lifestyle. And the main thing that you see in verses 3 to 8 is the key is pursue purity. That's the first expectation from us that God has. Living a life of purity. Now let me say this. It is not easy for us broken people. I'm using just another metaphor for saying fallen or sinful. And yet this is God's intention for us. Did not our Lord Jesus say, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. God's desire is that, that you and I will grow in purity. We'll pursue it. We'll have a passion for it. We'll struggle with it. When we fail, we will not give up. But we realize this is God's primary expectations in our life. God's primary will in our life is that we are called to be a holy people. Holy doesn't mean we dress differently necessarily. Pastor says you want, he wanted us to wear ethnic clothes next Sunday. I decided to do it this Sunday also. It's not our dress that is going to show we are holy. It's not our hairstyle necessarily show we are holy. Though Some people have this, praise the Lord, hairstyle is always live, lifted up. I like that. You know, I just tell people who have got hair, you know, if you have hair, flaunt it. It's all right. <laughs> because sometimes you may not have it. <laughs> I also used to have a lot of hair. I have pictures to prove that. <laughs> That's all I'm left with, pictures. <laughs> a lot of hair. But what makes us different? It's not our appearance, not necessarily. It's going to be our lifestyle. It's going to be our value system. It's going to be what do we pursue in our lives. And God's purpose is we are set apart for Jesus, for God's kingdom purposes. Our pastor has been preaching on that. Kingdom purposes. Holiness means we are set apart for God's kingdom purposes. And the main point that we have already read in the next passage is that Christians must exercise sexual self-control. That's what Paul is saying in this whole passage. Sexual self-control. Now, if you have a, a King James Bible or a New King James, in verse 4, you have some very interesting ways to translate an idiom there. See, idioms don't necessarily translate the same way in, from one language to the other. And there is an idiom in verse 4, which therefore some versions will say, you must possess your vessel. And a vessel to me is a cooking vessel. And what does that mean? Or somebody must, uh, what, what are the other translations? Learn to acquire a wife. That could be one translation. But probably the idiom means, and NIV translates it as, learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in the way the world accepts. You see, the world outside has a very different way of looking at the whole area of sexuality. Is perfectly all right in certain things in the world. But God says, my people are going to be different. That is God's expectations of us. That we exercise self-control. Sexuality to be kept within the bond of marriage. And uh, this is God's intentions. And in this, what Paul says in verse 6... No one should take advantage of another, especially from a position of power over the other. You see, there are people who are especially vulnerable when others have power over them, including, let me say this, in the church. We have 
lot of stories of abuse of power that comes out in this area. Recent news about a, a person, I, I don't want to mention names, but a person who had a cult-like group in the U.S. and uh, several celebrities were going there. He recently died, but there were a lot of um, accusations ag uh, against him of, of sexual harassment or sexual exploitation of people under, under him because he was given power. Everybody said, yes, sir, to him. And uh, they just, and he told them where to work and whom not to meet and what to do with their money. And they would give him all their money. That kind of control where people then begin to exploit. Don't let anybody exploit you, dear friends. And be careful. You also have power over others. Every one of us has power over somebody else. Every one of us. And so be careful in the use of power. That we are careful, not only in the area of sexuality here, though it's mentioned that way. I don't know whether Timothy, when he came back and met Paul, gave him some, some you know, hint that there is something going on there, Paul. Maybe you need to mention this, the church there. Maybe there is somebody there in the church who is playing around with this. Remember, this is the area where there could be believers who had slaves. And they could exploit their slaves. Because slaves were your property. You could do whatever you want. We don't understand what is happening. We don't know everything. But Paul says, be very careful. Why? Because God does not and will not tolerate sexual impurity. And what he says here is, therefore anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject the human being, but God. The very God who gives us his Holy Spirit. Why does God give us the Holy Spirit? Simple answer, to be holy. You know, sometimes in the Pentecostal church, because we do believe in and we emphasize power to do things, we forget the first reason the Holy Spirit is given to Jacob Cherian and to you is that Jacob Cherian better get holy. We live a holy life, have a passion for holiness. God does not and will not tolerate sexual impurity even in the lives of his leaders. No one is exempt. And when we reject this call for holiness, we are rejecting God. So what's God's primary expectations in our life? Number one, in one word, give me one word. Purity. Holiness. That's God's call. The second thing we find from verse 9 to 12. This is wonderful. What does God want us to do? Look at verse 9. In fact, in the prayer of Paul in chapter 3, remember what is the first thing he prayed for? You should what? Grow in love. Grow in love. You know, it's interesting. I've been preaching for the last 38 years. And um, I have prayed for a lot of people. And in my experience, I have yet to have anyone come to me and say, Pastor, pray for me. So usually I'll ask, what do you want me to pray for? Some people say, just pray, Pastor. <laughs> Some people want you to lay hands and prophesy. Uh, and they'll say, sometimes they will say, I have this problem or that problem. Or, you know, some of them are ready to say, I have a problem with anger. Anybody here who has a problem? Nobody has a problem with anger. But some other people who don't come to church, they, no, they do come to church. <laughs> it's easy for us to talk about certain things that, we struggle with. Maybe anger is easy to talk about. But I have yet to have somebody come to me and say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to grow in love. They, they came to me because they had some love problems. <laughs> That's a different issue. Yeah? They were in love for, and this person has now rejected them, etc., etc., whatever. But growing in love, nobody has yet come to me. Pastor, please pray. I want to grow in love. But friends... The Bible says something wonderful. And John puts it in some of the most simple language, 1 John 4, 8. God is love. So how is my spirituality measured then? If God is love. That I have a loud voice when I pray? Or... I have a special dress code that I use? 
or am I like God? I'm growing to be like God, growing in love. Look at what it says here. Now about your love for one another. We don't need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. Next slide. You see, no, no, okay, not yet. Okay. The, a real experience with God, who is love, will result in people growing in love with each other. Love for the others. And verse 10, and in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia, yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. Look at this. This is a beautiful church. It's a new church. It's not very old. This church is already doing well. They already, Paul says, you are already doing, now do so more and more. More and more. You're doing well. Come on. Do so more and more. And maybe that's what God is saying to many of us today. You're doing well. Come on, keep going. Do so more and more. The majority of the community members are growing in this aspect. However, it seems a minority is abusing community love. And they need to have an admonition in this regard. You'll find that later on in chapter 5, verse 14, they are admonished. And also in, chapter, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, they're admonished. Some people are failing in this. How? Very specific. Let's look at that verse 11. Verse 11. Now to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. Don't you like that? What is this leading a quiet life? All of us have this idea of, you know, a beautiful, isn't that what they show you on those big hoardings? Come and come here to this place. Buy a villa here. There's a beautiful stream there. There are jogging paths there. Isn't that what you'd like to buy? Well, yeah, that's what we would like to have. We, we like those nice, beautiful, almost paradise. When we want, go on a holiday, we want to go to places like that. Quiet life. Now, that's not what Paul is talking about. Many of us living in cities are not going to have a very quiet life. Uh, if you're going to be living in one of the hundreds of apartments... What is Paul talking about? The quiet life here is live a life without unnecessary conflict. You know, do not disturb others. How? By the way, this whole passage is about growing in love. How do we grow in love? Live in peace with others around you. You know, smile at your neighbors even though they don't smile at you. <laughs> That's all right. Maybe they're having their whatever. You smile at them. Say, good morning, auntie. How are you? <laughs> it's all right. You say good morning. Live in a way that you don't have unnecessary conflict with others. And then, what do you have in your English Bible? What's the next verse? You should. What does it say? Does your Bible have, you should mind your own business? Does it have it? Yes or no? Your Bible also has it, okay. You should mind your own business. Now, what does that mean? Now, the problem is, we use the term, mind your own business means, hey, fellow, you mind your own business. Don't poke your nose into my business, right? We tell people, you mind your own business, I mind my own business. That's not what Paul is saying. In fact, he's saying the very opposite. He's saying, put your mind into your business. So that, you will not neglect the work you have to do. Work hard. That's what he's talking about. He's saying, work hard at your business and follow my example. See, as he says, and with your hands, just as we told you. Please, did you notice that? Work hard with your hands. Now, if you're an IT person or a lawyer or a doctor, um, normally, unless you're a surgeon, maybe you may talk about working hard with your hands. What does that phrase tell you about this church? That the majority of this church looks like are people who work with their hands. They are laborers. They are artisans. They make things with their hands. They are not the super rich of the city. Though, by the way, Thessalonica is a very big city. The second major city in, the, in that part of the world. So what happens? Paul is saying, I want you to work. Don't neglect work. 
put your mind into your business. Now, why is he talking about working hard when he's talking about growing in love? What does growing in love and working hard have to do with each other? Very simple. There's a straightforward connection. Working hard brings about two results. Number one, what does it do? It brings about the respect of outsiders. You know, one of the greatest things we can do for the gospel is that people respect those who represent the gospel. If people know us as Christians and followers of Christ, one of the greatest evangelistic tools is if people respect us, then they will be ready to think about our gospel. People must learn to, people must respect us, not they have to learn. We have to do our part that people will respect us because we work hard in an office if the boss is not a follower of Jesus he says you know that guy John yeah you know he yeah he believes this and that I mean I don't agree with all that but I tell you I don't have anybody like him in this office I can entrust my things to him he is honest I will not trust some other fellows but I'll trust John you know why because he's trustworthy. That's growing in love. When we can win the respect of outsiders by the way we do our work, whatever our work is, it, you may be a homemaker, you may be a student, you may be a doctor, you may be a preacher or a Bible college teacher. Whatever we are doing, by the way we work, we must earn the respect of those who are not followers of Christ. They must respect us. There's no use of us telling things if they don't respect us. Second thing he says, when you do that, you will not be dependent on, you will not be an unnecessary burden on somebody else. Now, if you read 2 Thessalonians, you'll find some people are like that. There are some people who are not working but they are eating. How do you eat when you don't work? Somebody else is working for you. You know? So, what does do Brother Jacob? He doesn't want to work. What does he do? When it's about lunchtime or dinner time, he quietly knocks on the door of Pastor Gavin's house. Dinner time. He can smell the food coming through the door. And then he says, ah, yes, sir, Brother Jacob, how are you? And I was just going through this way. I thought I'll come by and visit you. Ah, um, we, we are about to have, you like to join us? Uh, you know, uh, this is, no, please have it. Okay. <laughs> Somehow or the other, I become a burden on somebody else unnecessarily. Now, let me tell you this. One of the important things that we must do is there are people who cannot take care of each other. Sometimes those may be our parents. Or when our children, they cannot take care of themselves. We take care of them. There are people in our families, in our societies who must be taken care of. And that's our responsibility as our families and as churches. We must take care. However, when we can work and support ourselves and we fail to do that, we are putting our burden on somebody else. Now, what is the connection with all this and love? Please tell me. <laughs> How does love and working hard come together? Very, very simple. In another similar place, but in another letter, Ephesians 4.28, Paul says, in Ephesians 4.28, if you'll turn with me to that beautiful passage, uh, Paul says in Ephesians 4.28, Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer. Okay, I'm going to ask you a very simple question. Who's writing this letter? Who's writing this letter? Paul. Is he writing to believers or unbelievers? Come on. Answer is very simple. He's writing to believers. And what is he telling believers? Believers, some of you have been stealing... Stop it. Believers? Stealing? Of course. Of course they do, believers. We may justify our stealing in different ways, but we take what doesn't belong. For example, if I get a salary without working for it, I'm stealing. 
If I'm slouching on my in my work time, I'm stealing. He says, stop it. But what he should do? But, come on, look at the text. Ephesians 4.28. You must work doing something useful with their hands. Work hard so that they may have something to share with those in need. And that's where the rubber hits the road. When you and I work hard, what Paul is saying is we will not only take care of our needs and we will not put our burden on somebody else, but rather what is going to happen is we will have much to share. Or even if it's not much, but we can then share with those who are in need. And that is love. That is growing in love. That's what we have learned in most of our homes. Mothers, you know, they get up early. They do this. They work. Sometimes they cook the meal. And after that, they go to work. Now, I had a mother who worked. I salute her. Worked very hard for the family. You know, why? Because she is doing that to be a blessing to the family and to others. When you and I work hard, then God blesses us, not that we give just our tithes. I do believe in giving of tithes. It's a good principle. But if all our life, all we do is give tithe, we have not grown. Start with tithes. That's 10 person, by the way. Tithe just means 10 person. So if you give nine, it's not, you're not giving tithe. We grow in giving, and that's the way we grow in love. I know of a friend, I won't mention the name, who's, who studied in SABC, went to the US, married a lady who's a nurse, and if you know, most places, uh, most uh, nurses in America earn a good salary. They have nice houses, and they keep moving every five years into a newer house, nicer house. Um, but this family remained in that same house. I have lived in that house. I know, it's a small house, American standards. Many of you live in better houses than that. But this lady has this heart that most of her earning, she gives it away for missions in India. So living in America, she lives in a small little house, has not changed the house in 20 years. But she works hard and she's growing in love because she's able to give. Friends, finally let me tell you a secret. This secret you can learn from the believers from Macedonia. Macedonia was one of the places, it's still there by the way, a place is in Greece. And Thessalonians, the church comes from there. But there was another church also from Macedonia. Which church? Philip, Philippi, the church at Philippi. There was something about the Philippian church and the Thessalonian church that Paul praises when he talks about missions giving in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. With this verse, I will close. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 2. I want to give it to you as a mantra. Mark it in your Bibles. Memorize it if you can. Let me tell you, this is a secret. The secret of joy. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 2. Once again, let me remind you, we're talking about God's expectations. What is God's expectations of us? Number one, grow in purity. A passion for purity. Secondly, Grow in love. And how do I grow in love? One way Paul says here is, work hard. And when you work hard, you will take care of your responsibilities, but then you will be able to share with many others. A well-known pastor in the U.S. wrote a book that became a huge bestseller. He made millions of upon millions. Every month, a million copies of that book still sells. So what do you do with all this money? 
Some American pastors don't mind flaunting that money with big houses and buying a fleet of jets. This pastor decided to stay in the same house that he has. He's a large church and uh, chose to have the same car he was driving. He chose to have the same wife he had. He chose not to buy yachts and planes. Rather, he decided to give back to his church all the salary he had earned in the last 20 years. He played it back, gave it back to the church. Because just the royalty of the books is so much. And he decided not to give 10%, but to give 90% away. And maintain the same, a decent lifestyle. He already was a pastor of a mega church. What are we talking about, friends? Growing in love. And one sign of that is growing in generosity. Hallelujah. Look at this verse and I close. Verse 2, Paul is talking about the grace God has given to the Macedonian churches in verse 1. Many times we are taught to say, how are you doing? What is our usual answer? When somebody asks you, how are you doing? What, what do you say? Oh, the spiritual. Give me a spiritual answer. By the grace of God. That sounds very spiritual now. By the grace of God, I'm doing well. But sometimes stick around some more time with that person, you'll realize it's not all so much grace. He's a very clever guy. He has done it all himself. He's a self-made man. But we have learned to say the right word, by the grace of God. The sign of grace, verse 1, is in verse 2. The evidence of the grace of God, verse 2, he says, in the midst of a very severe trial. The Macedonian churches are not having an easy time. They are going through a very severe trial. Number two, what is the next word? Their overflowing joy. Do those things come together? <laughs> you know, when I am going through a severe trial, you look at my face, what's wrong? No, oh, because hmm. my face will tell you I'm going through a very severe trial. Overflowing joy. And what is the next word? Extreme poverty. Not poverty, friends. Extreme poverty. How do you have overflowing joy when you have a very severe trial and extreme poverty? Anybody here has extreme poverty? <laughs> Thirdly, for, fourthly it says, welled up in rich generosity. You read this passage, they beg Paul, Paul, please take our money and give it to our dear brothers whom we have never seen. You know, next Sunday we will be seeing these pastors whom we are supporting. But the, the Macedonians are giving money for the poor Jewish believers who don't really care for them too much in Jerusalem, but they are needy. They are our believers. They are our brothers and sisters. In fact, they are from the same line of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are not from that same ethnic line. We are Gentiles. But they are our brothers and sisters. Please take our money. Wow. Paul praises the grace of God in their lives. Friends, this is the biblical teaching of growing in love for God and for everyone else. Love is manifested in our generosity and sharing in the needs of others. I know of a family in the U.S. I remember they were doing well, both husband and wife were earning a good salary. And they chose to remain in a decent-sized small house when everybody around them, you know, upgrades. That's all right. Some of us may be called to do that. That's fine. But the point is, they chose to increase their giving and they chose to remain satisfied, contented in the house they had. That is growing in love. Love is manifested in such good works and generosity. May the Lord help us to meet his expectations and give him joy. You know, when we give like this, what happens is our joy is only a reflection of the God's joy. When God starts getting happy with us, man, 
Oh, look at my son. Oh, look at my daughter. Oh, I'm so proud of them. Don't some parents like to do that? Praise sometimes. I'll be careful what I say. What happens? That reflection of the joy of God is seen in our lives when we grow in love and generosity. God's expectations, two things I've shared with you today, growing in purity and growing in love and generosity. Let us pray. I want us to just take a moment and just thank God for God's word. He has made his expectations clear of us, but he has also shown us his love. You know, God doesn't ask me to love or grow in love without himself becoming the model. Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, that a person lays down their life for their friends. God himself has shown us what love is all about. He sacrificed. He didn't hold back anything. God, Jesus was the only one who could have chosen which family he could be born in. The only one. None of us chose our families. He chose to be in the home of a very simple man and woman. Poor. They were not rich. He lived in the limitations of broken humanity. He gave everything. Love. We have a model in our Lord Jesus. But then we also have models like our Macedonian brothers and sisters. May God help us to grow in purity and love. If that is your prayer, I just want you to join in prayer. If you want to lift your hand or you want to stand up, whichever way, just take a moment to say, Lord, help me to grow in purity and in love. Just lift your hand as you're seated. Just lift your hand and say, Lord, help me to grow in purity and love. That is our prayer. Heavenly Father, enable us through the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name.